Hey guys, welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about how men can optimize their health and escape the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. Today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite drugs, Cialis or Tadalafil. And we're going to talk about it strictly within the context of its effects on blood pressure. So why are we going to do this? Well, invariably, when I go on the TRT forums and kind of troll around a little bit, um, I will see a post on hypertension. Some guy will say, hey, I went to my doctor. My blood pressure was 150 over 90. He wants to put me on X, Y, or Z medication. And invariably, in the comment section, there's going to be a litany of posts in there. They're like, nah, bro, you need, you, you know, don't do that. You just need to, one of two things, bro, you need to go donate blood which let me tell you is a terrible way to manage chronic hypertension, okay? Uh, or no, just get on Cialis five milligrams a day. It'll fix you right up. And then actually the third thing I see is a whole litany of like herbal supplement recommendations. Hey man, I take berberine or whatever, you know, for my, my knock my blood pressure down by 20 points. But the, the one thing I do want to focus on in that, little narrative there that actually does have some merit and it is the Cialis and the Tadalafil, specifically the, the daily dosing that we'll see. Typically, it's going to be five to 10 milligrams a day. Most most guys use it for uh, ED for that purpose, but it um, may, in certain cases, be something that you can, can consider as an adjunct to address high blood pressure. So I'm going to show you guys some of the studies about that. So don't go donate blood and don't go take a bunch of wacky herbal supplements to get your blood. If you genuinely have hypertension, you need to be seen by your doctor. Okay, you need to get a proper diagnosis, you need a proper workup, and you don't need to be going on the TRT bro forums and getting advice on how to manage your cardiovascular disease. Okay, please don't do that. <laughs> All right, having said that, um, I'll put a link to this in the in the show notes down below, but this is something that you might find useful. Highlights from the 2017 guideline for the prevention, detection, evaluation, and management of high blood pressure in adults. This comes from the, the American College of Cardiology, okay, and the American Heart Association Task Force on Clinical Practice Guidelines. So I won't dive into this too deeply because you guys, if you're more interested, you can obviously you can go and, and download this little PDF document. But look, you know, the thing I want to point out is what is considered a normal blood pressure. You know, what's normal? Okay. Well, normal is under 120 over 80, which, you know, honestly, it causes a lot of consternation among among folks and doctors too, because very few people qualify for a diagnosis of normal blood pressure these days. And almost um, all of us out there will probably require some pharmaceutical uh, assistance in order to get down to 120 uh, over 80. Now, that's not necessarily true. If you do everything perfectly from a lifestyle standpoint, um, yeah, that's an achievable blood pressure, but it's 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 challenging for most people to get there completely on their own. And um, that's just that's just the way it is. Now, Stage one hypertension is 130 over 139 systolic, okay, or 80 to 89 diastolic. And I'm sure most of us have been to the doctor's office with blood pressures. You know, a lot of us that are on TRT and, and lift weights and maybe we're, and we're over 200 pounds, a lot of times we'll go in there with blood pressures in that range and the doctor's like, yeah, you're fine. And they, or they won't even mention it. Um, because quite honestly, I mean, both in the emergency room and the primary care clinic, uh, we're used to seeing blood pressures so much higher than that, that when like a 135 over 85 walks in, it's like, I don't even have time to address that <laughs> right now because there's, you know, I'm just so used to seeing such, uh, you know, markedly elevated blood pressures, 190s, 200s, uh, over 110s. That's kind of like, uh, you know, the blood pressures like that are a dime a dozen for me in my in my hospital practice. So, but the point is, uh, that's still that's hypertension. That's stage one hypertension, and your risk of adverse cardiac events and your risk of a adverse cardiac outcome over time is elevated, even with these you know seemingly innocuous blood pressures. And that inflection curve over time, you know, it, it starts to go up with systolic blood pressures over 120. And um, that's just what the data shows. So don't kill the messenger, but that's 
That's what the data shows. And certainly once you hit 140 over 90, which has been kind of the traditional marker to initiate drug therapy, that's actually stage two hypertension. And that's when that curve really goes up. You start seeing a lot more heart attacks, a lot more strokes down the road. But it's important to realize hypertension does its damage to the cardiovascular system and to the brain and to the kidneys and basically all of the organs in your body over decades, many, 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 many years, okay? So it's just like running around with super high LDL or ApoB levels for 20 or 30 years. There's likely to be a, a cost to that. So it, it's challenging because it, this requires lifelong attention on your part, not necessarily medications, but lifelong attention to this number because it really does have a serious impact on, on your longevity and the quality of your life, especially at the last, you know, in that last decade of your life. So. Pay attention to your blood pressure. It's super important. Yet it's one of the easiest things to measure. One of the most easiest things to track. To to track. And and honestly, it's of all the medical issues that I run into, it's it's one of the easiest to treat and to take care of because the combination of aggressive lifestyle modifications, especially with uh, visceral body fat, weight loss, etc., in addition to the occasional sprinkle of a pharmaceutical drug, it uh, it's very you know those things work very well for for treating hypertension. So Tadalafil is, as you guys I'm sure are aware, it's a PDE5 phosphodiesterase number five um, inhibitor. It's along with um, sildenafil, along with var uh, vardenafil. There's several others on the market, but I think it's probably fair to say that Tadalafil is the most popular one, probably because it has perhaps a slightly better side effect profile, but also the long half-life. So 17 and a half hour half-life. So it's, it's the weekend drug, right? You take it Friday evening, and usually you, you're gonna be good to go all the way through Sunday morning at least. And it, um, you know, it's extremely well tolerated. And now that it's a generic, the prices have come down a lot. So by far, I think this is the probably the most popular ED drug. But the interesting thing about Tadalafil and the thing that has piqued my interest in it over the last few years is that we're discovering as time goes on, it has a number of other properties that may be related to our pursuit of longevity and better health and avoiding cardiovascular disease. So it, it is approved, FDA approved for erectile dysfunction. It works extremely well for that. It's FDA approved for symptoms of BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy. Um, and it does work very well for that. It gets used off label quite a bit. In addition to some of the other uh, PDE5 drugs for a condition called pulmonary hypertension, um, which I'm not going to get into. It works, you know pretty well for that. I actually have a few patients that I see occasionally in the, in the ER that live in my community with, with pulmonary hypertension that are on, on these drugs and it, uh, it does well. But what's interesting about it is that it has a lot of potential to treat endothelial dysfunction and all of the diseases related to endothelial dysfunction of which there are many. So we're seeing, um, you know, with its ability to increase nitric oxide, um, that not only are we able to help sometimes people with uh, chronic angina, myocardial ischemia, heart failure, peripheral arterial disease, Raynaud's, where the you know the blood vessels will clamp down in your fingers. Um, you may know somebody that that gets that, where their fingers turn white and then they turn blue and then they turn red, and that's a it's an autoimmune phenomenon associated with a lot of other bad autoimmune um, conditions. So. It has potential to treat all of those. And, you know, I, I think time will tell just how useful it is for some of these other conditions. But this ability to increase nitric oxide, to vasodilate and cause smooth muscle relaxation, in addition to potentially um, some effects involving the androgen receptor in terms of effects of uh, uh, modulating insulin resistance, perhaps through some anti-inflammatory pathways. All of this stuff is, is in the process of being worked out and I think has a lot of potential. So, so Tadalafil at a low dose, and I'm talking, you know, usually the five milligram daily dose. Sometimes there are guys that do two and a half uh, as part of their quote anti-aging uh, protocol that um, that swear by this. Um, I, I think there's a lot of potential here. I take it myself, and um, I, th I think that as time goes on, we're going to get some. We're going to find that there's going to be a lot of spinoffs uh, of this drug that go way beyond just ED, pulmonary hypertension, and uh, and BPH. 
Okay, I'm going to take one one little minor diversion here too to rant at you guys uh, a tiny little bit. It's uh, it's occasionally it's a challenge for me to get guys to care about cardiovascular disease. It's it's difficult for especially young guys to think you know, 30 years in the future. And when I tell them, listen, man, I don't want you to have a heart attack. I don't want you to have heart failure, chronic kidney disease. I don't want you to have a stroke in 30 years. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but when I tell them, hey, listen, if you want to be able to still get an erection in five years or in 10 years, then really like you need to start paying attention to not just your blood pressure, but your blood sugars. You need to pay attention to your lipids and you really need to kind of, you know, clean up your lifestyle. And as soon as I start mentioning erections, they're like, it will, they, all of a sudden they're starting to pay attention. Okay. So, you know, they talk about ED as the canary in the coal mine, meaning that uh, many times erectile dysfunction or dysfunction is an early sign or a harbinger of a more serious underlying process. And specifically, it's the development of cardiovascular disease in the form of atherosclerosis, etc. So this, this is a, a diagram that I like to include. I, I include this in a lot of when I give lectures on atherosclerosis, because I think it's, I don't know, just in a, I think it really, represents what I'm trying to explain to you guys quite well. So what we see at the top here, these are cross sections of various arteries in your body that have clinical relevance, especially to me as an emergency room physician. So, and it shows their, their rough diameter. So the femoral artery, which is down here in your groin, okay, it's six to eight millimeters across. It's, you know, unless you're super chubby, you can feel down there when, you know, when a trauma patient comes in and I need to find a pulse really quick, I, I feel for the carotid or sometimes I'll feel for the femoral artery. When I'm putting in a femoral line, I will put my fingers and feel, feel the pulse of the femoral artery. And usually if you're, you're relatively thin. And even if you're not, I mean, I can usually, you know, that's a big artery, right? Six to eight millimeters across. I can usually feel that pulse unless your blood pressure is tanked. And then, you know, that's a, that's a problem. So the other one is the internal carotid artery. Okay. This is, you can develop atherosclerotic plaque there. It's one of the, one of the major reasons people have strokes, especially big, like they call them hemiplegic strokes is from, um, atherosclerotic plaque buildup that sometimes embolizes uh, within the carotid artery, but that's pretty big too, like five to seven millimeters across. Like that's why it's easy to feel that pulse. It's not just because it's close to the surface of the skin, which it is, but it's because of the diameter of that artery. Okay. And that's why like with the femoral artery, if you guys remember, uh, that scene from Black Hawk Down where that young guy, the ranger bleeds out, he bleeds out and bleeds to death. That's from a laceration of the femoral artery. And I, trust me, I've taken care of those firsthand. And yeah, it's a freaking bloodbath and it's a hard, it's a hard artery to get a handle on because you can lose a lot of blood in a very short period of time from those big arteries, you know, same in your neck. A coronary artery is a bit smaller, three to four millimeters, but the one the, the one that you guys seem to care about the most is the penile artery. And you can apply this to the pudendal artery as well. Both of these are critically important, obviously for you in terms of, uh, you know, achieving and maintaining an erection. Um, the reason I'm showing you the diameters here is because typically when plaque in your arteries builds up, when atherosclerosis builds up, it will be obviously at a low level for, for decades usually. Um, and I've talked about this in other talks, but atherosclerosis begins often in childhood. And many of you are not aware of that. So your 10 year old son ha likely has the very first signs of atherosclerosis. If, if someone were to look inside his arteries. So it begins in childhood, but typically it has to reach a, a, a point where 50% of the lumen is now compromised by this cholesterol plaque, this atherosclerotic plaque, before it becomes a symptomatic issue. So, you know, in the femoral artery, you start getting more than 50% blockage. Maybe you're, when you exert yourself, when you try to run or, or hike, uh, or, you know, walk for really long periods of time, now you've got, um, a limitation to the blood flow and, and a limitation in the ability of your blood to deliver oxygen to those working muscles. And now you start getting pain in your, in your glutes and your quads, maybe down in your calves, depending on where the stenosis is. Okay. If you start getting serious stenosis in your carotid arteries, obviously that can present as a stroke. Coronary arteries 
If you start having more than 50% plaque buildup, especially as you get higher, depending on how hard you decide to exert yourself, that's when you get angina, right? Chest pain. That's the guy that like, he's walking up the stairs and he has to stop because he gets chest pain. And once he stops, you know, and then the, you know, the myocardial oxygen demand starts going down. And then, you know, that 50%, 70% stenosis, whatever it is, is no longer uh, flow limiting or rate limiting and the pain goes away. Well, you know, the same thing happens in the penile artery, right? You get a 50% blockage in your penile artery, um, you're gonna have you're gonna have a problem. How long do you think it takes to get a 50% blockage in your femoral artery versus getting a 50% blockage in your penile artery? Obviously, with with the larger diameter of the femoral artery, it could take your entire lifetime to get a 50% stenosis of the femoral artery. Um, same with your internal carotid artery. In fact, you may die with a 45% um, a 45% uh, stenosis and never know it. But the penile artery, it's only, you know, it's one millimeter, maybe two millimeters if you're lucky, right? So it doesn't take very much atherosclerotic plaque to compromise blood flow to the penile artery. And you can see that, you can see that in guys in their late 20s and early 30s who don't take care of themselves, who've had lifelong high blood pressure, lifelong uh, inflammatory markers that are through the roof, lifelong elevated blood sugars, and um, lifelong, you know, lipid abnormalities as well. So it doesn't take very long. And that's why when you, even if you're in your 20s, it's not okay to be running around with blood pressures of 140 over 90, um, et cetera. Like you need to get that addressed because because of this this reason exactly. So um, so enough. I'm going to get off my soapbox about that. But it, treating and and mo monitoring and treating your blood pressure, this is something that every man needs to do. Even if you're not on medication, you need to keep you need to keep tabs on this because it it really does have important implications down the road for you. You might not think so when you're when you're 22 years old and chasing tail uh, on your college campus, but trust me, it, it this kind of thing will catch up with you if you don't uh, if you don't look after it. All right, enough on that. So let's talk about Tadalafil and some of the data out there in terms of blood pressure. Is this a viable medication to use as an antihypertensive, like they say on the forums? All right. So this is from the European Heart Journal Supplement 2002 overview of the cardiovascular effects of Tadalafil. It's a great paper. It goes through a bunch of different studies on it, and um, I think I found it uh, I found it very useful. So we're going to look at a few different scenarios here. So. The initial studies were with uh, with healthy men, okay, who did did not have high blood pressure. I should probably put healthy in air quotes because sometimes the people that they slip into these studies are not as healthy as as you. Well, they're not they're not healthy in the way that you and I would define healthy. But regardless, the the groups that they got for these initial studies, I'm going to show you were they didn't have high blood pressure. So normal guys, typically uh, between age 40 and like 55. Okay, so we're going to look at studies where they give them a single dose, and then we're going to look at studies where they're on it uh, a little bit longer and chronically to see if there's any sort of blood pressure effect. Okay, so this study here, so this is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled parallel group study. We're looking at the effects of Tadalafil on hemodynamics. So they looked at blood pressure and heart rate uh, in 80 healthy subjects. So what they did is they either gave them a placebo they gave them 10 milligrams of Tadalafil, or they gave them 20 milligrams of Tadalafil, and then they looked at their blood pressure and their heart rate. And then they also did it for, um, they had a, they did it again, but they did it for 10 days straight to see if, you know, achieving a, t a steady state level by the end of day 10 to see if, you know, maybe there was an effect that wasn't there with just a single dose. Interestingly enough, 20 milligrams, so 20, you know, obviously 20 milligrams, 10 to 20 is like the standard one-time dose if you want to go out and have a good weekend with your, with your, with your spouse. Um, so that's what they used here. They used uh, 10 and 20. So Tadalafil 20 milligrams was equivalent to placebo on both one and day 10. The mean difference in standing systolic blood pressure between Tadalafil 20 milligrams and placebo, you ready for this? It dropped, it dropped systolic blood pressure. 0 0.2 milligrams of mercury on day one and 0 0.9, we'll just call it one. It dropped it by one point on day 10. Okay, not, not a great effect. 
Now that was systolic. The mean decrease in diastolic blood pressure compared with placebo was minus 4.6 mill millimeters of mercury. So you get a little bit more diastolic drop um, and virtually no drop in uh, the systolic blood pressure. It says these results indicate that tadalafil has no clinically relevant effects on hemodynamic measurements in healthy subjects. Okay, here's the chart uh, which kind of lays that out here. So we have uh, blood pressure on the uh, on the y-axis, time in hours. So this is just for like, this is for single dose, uh, obviously. So we have placebo, and then we have the 10 and the 20 milligram group. So placebo is the, is the uh, closed circle here. And as you can see with systolic blood pressure, whether you got placebo, 10 or 20 of Tadalafil didn't make a whole heck of a lot of difference. You got a little bit of a drop, obviously, um, in the Tadalafil group, but not, not enough to be clinically significant. And then the diastolic, you get a little more bang for your buck with your diastolic blood pressure, but again, not very much. And in fact, um, the only one that reached statistical significance was the 20 milligram dose. So 10, 10 milligrams and placebo, were basically the same. So did not really seem to help. Okay. Well, the question is, well, maybe 10 days isn't long enough. Maybe we need to take this out even longer. And that's what they did here with this paper, Cardiovascular Effects of Tadalafil. This is a 2003 paper. So they looked at a uh, group of healthy men, average age was 50.8, and they gave them 20 milligrams every single day for 26 weeks, which really nobody does that. Uh, it's typically, again, it's the five milligram dose is the, is the daily dose. That, that's what's approved uh, for ED. So this is a whopping, this is the one-time dose given every single day uh, for 26 weeks. So there's a few take homes from this study. One is that they tolerated that dose just fine. There didn't really seem to be a huge uh, dropout rate, you know, no major side effects. So, so, you know, I don't recommend 20 milligrams a day, but obviously in this study, you know, that's what they did for 26 weeks, which is, you know, a pretty lengthy period of time. And these guys seem to do okay with that. All right. Here's what's interesting. The mean change in, in systolic blood pressure was similar for Tadalafil. Uh, 0.49, it dropped, okay, versus placebo. It actually dropped more in the placebo, 1.35 millimeters of mercury. So technically, placebo worked better than Tadalafil in this particular study. Um, in addition, the mean change in sitting diastolic blood pressure after 26 weeks, again, of 20 milligrams a day, 2.79, we'll just say 2.8 millimeters of mercury drop, was similar to the mean change with placebo, which was 0.63. So, I'll sum it up here. They say these results suggest that daily administration of Tadalafil 20 milligrams for 26 weeks does not result in a statistically significant change in sitting blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure when compared with placebo in older, healthy male subjects with mild ED. Very interesting. Okay. But still, this is not, this doesn't close the door on this drug, okay, for blood pressure. Okay. Because in both of these studies, they used healthy people, right? People that did not have pre-existing hypertension. Well, what's going to happen if we take a bunch of guys who have who have uh, poorly controlled or uncontrolled hypertension? What if we take guys that have coronary artery disease? What if we take guys who are already on one or more blood pressure drugs but are still not at goal? Do we see an effect there? Yeah, actually, it starts. Things are starting to look a little bit better. So this is from the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology. And again, this is single dose. This is a single dose study. Influence of a single dose of 20 milligrams of Tadalafil, a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor on ambulatory blood pressures in subjects with hypertension. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll cut to the chase on this. So there, were, there actually was a, there was a notable effect here in this, in this group of men. Um, for so in men with who were weren't on any medication but just had uncontrolled hypertension, so they were above 140 over 90, they got a almost five point drop in systolic, so it was 4.8 millimeters of mercury, and a 2.9, we'll just say three millimeter drop in in their diastolic blood pressure with a single dose of this of 20 milligrams of Tadalafil. If they had uncontrolled blood pressure and they were being treated with one or more different medications, and by the way, they, they didn't segregate them out by the type of medication, it was just treated, not treated. So some of these guys were on ACE inhibitors, some of them were on diuretics, it didn't really seem to matter. 
they got an even bigger drop in their blood pressure. So seven and a half millimeters of mercury systolic and 4.3 millimeters diastolic. So, so there was an effect there, at least with this single dose. And there's a, a number of potential reasons for this um, that I want to talk with you guys about a little bit, but this, this is, this is interesting. Now there's another study in here that they talk about men with cor with stable coronary artery disease. Now, they they tended to have higher blood pressure than a than the control group, of course, because typically that's that's one of the reasons you get coronary artery disease is you tend to have higher blood pressures. They they got a really reasonable drop in their blood pressure as well, and these guys were already on blood pressure meds as well. Um, Ten milligrams of tadalafil reduced standing systolic blood pressure from one thirty four to one twenty seven, so it's a drop of seven millimeters of mercury in their that's their systolic. Diastolic dropped about four millimeters of mercury um, two hours after a ten milligram dose. So even at that ten milligram dose, that was there, there was an effect there. So what's interesting about about this to sum things up is if you don't have hypertension and you're presumably otherwise healthy, you, you're you really not going to get a substantial change in your blood pressure, either from acute dosing or chronic dosing of Tadalafil. However, if, if you have poorly controlled blood pressure or coronary artery disease, um, if you're on blood pressure medicines, but perhaps not as well controlled as you would like to be or your doctor would like you to be, there does seem to be a marginal effect uh, here as well. Now, it's important to remember, you know, these, these blood pressure drops are, they were statistically significant, but they're not as impressive as you would get with a first line antihypertensive medication that's dosed properly. It, they get close, but, you know, you typically are going to do better. Let's say you're on, let's say you're on Telmasartan and, you know, you, if you're still 10 points away from that 120 over 80 or whatever goal you and your doctor have set out to to achieve, Tadalafil probably won't get you there. It might. I mean, it's not, it's okay to try it, but you would probably have a better shot of getting there by adding in a second agent, whether it's a calcium channel blocker, whether it's, um, I usually don't recommend beta blockers unless there's a compelling indication with one with one exception that I'll talk about, you know, even a diuretic, which again, I'm not a big fan of diuretics. But the point is, um, you know, a traditional antihypertensive as a second agent will likely be more effective than just Tadalafil. However, if you're pretty close to goal, this is something you could definitely consider, especially in light of all of the other uh, potential benefits that I alluded to at the beginning of the talk. If you have high blood pressure, please see your doctor about it. There's actually a workup for anybody that comes in with high blood pressure. I know it feels like, and, I, and this does happen, you come in with a high blood pressure reading, there's no formal testing done, you just get thrown a prescription drug and, and sent out the door with no guidance, and unfortunately that, that happens a lot more often than it should. But really, um, we did, you know, your doctor needs to look into, okay, well, why, why do you have blood high blood pressure? Why do you have hypertension? Okay, may, maybe it's genetics, you know, that that's... You know, that's, that's entirely possible, but make sure you don't have sleep apnea. Um, quite frankly, most of the time you have to be honest with yourself. It's probably obesity related. Um, just dropping body weight, especially visceral body fat. Um, there is a, there is a, an, inf a inflammatory component to hypertension and lowering visceral body fat, addressing your fatty liver disease, et cetera, can actually go a long way towards lowering your blood pressure and helping you get off these medications. What's your sleep like? Um, how stressed out are you? Like all, all of these things obviously play a huge role. Um, do you have salt sensitive hypertension, right? That's a big one. Not everybody does. Sodium is, is directly related to blood pressure, regardless of what you might hear on the internet. But there are groups of people who are much more sensitive to sodium intake than uh, people who are not. I, I love salt. I salt everything. It doesn't move my blood pressure at all. Thank God, because <laughs> I love salt. Um, so, you know, I got lucky, I, you know, I have a gene that, that makes me resistant to the, uh, the blood pressure and hypertensive effects of sodium, which is cool. Um, but you may not, you may not have that. So you have to kind of sort that out and you should address all of those things. In addition to medication, if necessary, all of those things need to be addressed. 
And you'd be surprised many times if a guy can lose 30 pounds of visceral body fat, guess what? You don't need to be on two or three different antihypertensive drugs anymore. Maybe you don't need any. Maybe you just need one at a low dose. And that potentially could be Tadalafil, maybe. So anyway, that, I think it's important to say that. Um, I think you should have a home blood pressure cuff, but please like read up on how to use it. Um, you know, I joke, but it's really not a joke. I, I think you should have to pass a test to own a thermometer and to own a blood pressure cuff. Because I can't tell you how many ill-advised and unnecessary ER visits I get from those two pieces of home medical equipment. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> okay, so, so let me give you my opinion on this, uh, what I do. Um, if, if I diagnose a man with hypertension, and I've done a proper workup. We hit the lifestyle stuff extremely hard. If you need a medication, I, I don't jump to Tadalafil as my first line antihypertensive. It's not, it's not in any of the, um, the antihypertensive guidelines, which is, you know, I, I just follow JNC8, um, which is Joint National Commission. They have recommendations there. So I will typically, like a lot of doctors, look to an ARB, an angiotensin receptive blocker, maybe an ACE inhibitor. Okay. We all know about Telmosartan and the TRT community that that is probably, in my opinion, probably the best one, uh, mainly because of its long half-life and it's got a few interesting properties in terms of what it does with the PPAR gamma receptor, et cetera, which you can, if you want to learn more about that, I've got a video in my archives on that. You can, you can read up on that. But um, the, the primary benefits from ARBs are generally a class effect. So, you know, obviously these are the effects on blood pressure, on cardiac remodeling, on endothelial function. You can get those from other uh, other ARBs. So maybe it's not on your, your formulary for your healthcare plan. Maybe your doctor wants to give you a different one. It's totally fine. And the same thing with, with ACE inhibitors. I mean, th that's a very close second. Many of those same exact benefits overlap with ACEs and ARBs. So I don't get too wrapped up in the weeds about that. Um, I, there's obviously huge benefits from both of those drugs. I use um, ACE inhibitors quite a lot, actually, in the emergency department. You'd be surprised um, because we have intravenous uh, formulations there that I will use at times and, and people with like decompensated heart failure and things like that. So anyway, they, th th those are like my, the, the top, obviously. And I think most physicians, um, go that route as well. Now, um, beta blockers are not great antihypertensive drugs unless you, uh, have a compelling indication. So if you have coronary artery disease, if you have, uh, stable congestive heart failure, et cetera, you probably should be on a beta blocker. The one exception that I will throw in there is Nabivalol, which is a third generation beta blocker. And one of the problems with traditional beta blockers like metoprolol, which I use a truckload of metoprolol at the hospital because we have it intravenously, we have it uh, in oral formulations too. But, it, you know, as an outpatient, I don't care for it that much unless it's absolutely necessary. It, it can cause erectile dysfunction, but nabivalol does not. Um, nabivalol actually raises nitric oxide levels. And so there's actually some nice synergy and there's studies to support this between you're using low dose nabivalol, say like five milligrams, you can use 10, but five is, is fine, combined with low dose. So five of nabivalol and five of um, tadalafil sometimes is a great combination because you're killing two birds with one stone. You may be addressing some underlying cardiac issues and blood pressure, but you're also getting some synergy there in terms of uh, erectile dysfunction. I've seen that clinically. And again, there's papers to support that too. So that's, that's an option. And then occasionally I will use um, calcium channel blockers, probably amlodipine or your brand name is Norvask is the most common one. That's uh, probably third line. One thing that since we're on the subject of Tadalafil, you know, we always need to be aware of drug-drug interactions. So amlodipine and Tadalafil actually have a fairly, there's a potent interaction there where if you're on both of those drugs, the, le the serum levels of Tadalafil will go up. And that's because they compete for the same um, enzyme in the liver, which breaks those down. So Tadalafil get, um, gets... Uh, metabolized by this CYP3A4 cytochrome. Okay, it's an enzyme in the liver. It breaks down toxins, including drugs, but so do most calcium channel blockers, including amlodipine and even uh, like diltiazem, verapamil, which, you know, it's not that relevant for what we do here, but those are drugs that I use uh, in the hospital setting quite a bit. So if 
as you can see here, I'll put this chart up here. If if you are on to Dalafil, and um, you know, here's the serum levels here. We can see them in black. Tadalafil plus amlodipine, look, look what it does to the plasma concentrations of Tadalafil. It shoots them way up. So that's that's usually not an issue because Tadalafil is very well tolerated. But um, I will just say be careful if you're on amlodipine for blood pressure and your doctor throws in some Tadalafil. Um, some people look at this chart and actually see it as a benefit because you can achieve higher serum levels of Tadalafil with uh, amlodipine also in the picture than you know, than you could on its own. So maybe you wouldn't need 20 milligrams of Tadalafil to last you for a weekend. You could get away with five or ten because the amlodipine in the background is going to raise is going to the net result is that your serum levels of tadalafil are going to be higher. So I don't really look at it that way, but uh, you know that is one way to manipulate the uh, pharmacokinetics of tadalafil is to have some amlodipine on in the background. So I'm not saying you should do that, but this is just FYI for your information. What would I do if you come see me and let's say you're on talmasartan and you are fairly close to your blood pressure goal? Would I you know, and you, you want to be on Tadalafil, yeah, I think that that's, that's an okay thing to do. Um, I don't, I can't guarantee it's going to get you where you need to be, but I think that that's a reasonable second agent to add in there, especially if, yeah, you're just, you're, you're an uncontrolled um, hypertensive. It's not in the guidelines. It, you know, when JNC9 finally comes out, you know, maybe, maybe they'll slip that in there. So it would be complete, it's completely off label. So you just have to understand that. And we have to look for drug or drug interactions and just make sure that, um, you know, that you tolerate it well. But keep in mind, I mean, most people with genuine hypertension, especially if it's, if there's a genetic component, but also if they're just not willing to, to drop body weight and, and do many of the lifestyle things, they, it, it's rare for someone to have well-controlled blood pressure on just a single agent. Okay. Most of the time it's going to require combination therapy with two and sometimes three drugs. Okay. And that's, that's just, that's just the way it is. So, um, it's much safer to use lower doses of multiple drugs than it is to give you a high dose of a single drug. Cause you can, as you can imagine, you're going to get, um, there's potential for side effects based on dose. So it's better to use low dose two or three drugs than one dose at a high, at a high, uh, at a high dose. So the final thing that I'll leave you with, and, and this is just speculation on my part, but as I looked at those studies that showed that, you know, men without hypertension didn't really have a huge blood pressure change with Tadalafil, but men who had pre-existing hypertension or coronary artery disease did seem to get some benefit there. You know, that, that suggests to me, obviously, that the men with hypertension and coronary artery disease had some degree of underlying vasoconstriction and endothelial dysfunction. Again, which endothelial dysfunction is part and parcel with hypertension. So if, if you, as far as you know, are healthy, but you get a fairly substantial drop in your blood pressure every time you take Tadalafil, you know, if you get that five to seven millimeter drop in, in your systolic blood pressure and that, you know, two to five millimeter drop in your diastolic, you know, I, I'm curious, maybe, maybe that suggests that your endothelial health is not as good as you think it is. And maybe, maybe you are not as healthy as you think you are. Because again, in the study with healthy men, there really wasn't much of a change. So again, if, if you're noticing that drop in blood pressure every time you take Tadalafil, I think maybe that should raise a question in your mind that maybe I need to see my doctor. Maybe I need to get some comprehensive blood work and some additional testing and make sure I don't have underlying insulin resistance and cardiovascular disease or some other, you know, some other, some other issue like that. So, so having said that, uh, I will sign off. That's all I have for you guys today. I know a lot of you guys are on Tadalafil or Cialis and for a variety of different reasons. Please let me know what your experience has been. I always like to hear from you guys. You guys always, you always have the best questions. Um, I will catch you guys next time. I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you in the next video. Bye. All Man Medicine video and audio has been created and shared online for informational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute the practice of medicine or professional healthcare services of any kind, including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. 
As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here. And if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.